I can certainly tell you what it's going to be about. It is going to be about um, identity and theater, mainly. So I'll just say about myself that I'm uh, Sky Gilbert, and I, I'm a professor at the University of Guelph, and I used to be the artistic director of Buddies and Bad Times Theater, and I'm a writer. Um, and I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, wow, your names on my computer are in the same order as the way you were saying. We knew it. So there's yeah. some sort of, sort of weird symbiotic thing happening. So, um, and I'm going to ask you after I read my brief bio of you to say something that you're working on right now or will be working on in the near future, just to keep us up to date. Mel Haig is a, a Toronto-based curator and dramaturge. Mel is the Rhubarb Festival Director and Company Dramaturge at Buddies and Bad Times Theatre and the Artist Development Coordinator and Company Dramaturge at Obsidian Theatre Company. Wow, those are long titles. Previously, dramaturgy work includes Venus's Daughter by Megan Swaby, Obsidian in February 2016, and Up the Garden Path by Lisa Codrington. Obsidian Theatre Company, 216 Black Boys by Saga Collective with Buddies of Bad Times Theatre, November 2016. And I know those are kind of old. So what are you doing right now? <laughs> Besides enjoying pie, which I know you will be, hopefully. Uh, yes. Um, well, I'm actually in a workshop of the Obsidian Playwrights, uh, resident playwright right now. So I'm just up the street at Cahoots working on that uh, workshop. Um, upcoming, uh, yeah, the submissions come in for the Rhubarb Festival every a year in the fall, and so we get around like 100, 120 submissions, and so I'll be going through those. Over the Does time. everybody know what that is? Sorry to interrupt. Do everybody know what Rhubarb is? Well, it's such a fabulous thing. Just want to give, because I invented it. <laughs> <laughs> With some other people. But, so Mel, tell them what it is, because Mel runs it now. Yes, so it's the, we're in our 40th year. Um, it's a, an experimental performance festival that goes over two weeks at Buddies in Bad Times Theatre. Um, we get about 150 artists, 30 new pieces over two weeks. It's wild. And one of the great things about it, the original concept, and I think it still applies to one to some degree, is that a lot of the dramaturgy occurs through performance. So the, the original idea was come in and wow, no matter how crazy it is, no matter how screwed up it is, you got 20 minutes, put it up, see what happens with the audience. Because when I, when I started working back then, um, there was so much <coughs> dramaturgy. Now, I don't have any, we'll get into that, but I don't have anything against dramaturgists. Oh my God, what if I did? Wouldn't that be horrible? <laughs> but there was a period in my, some of my best friends are dramaturgists, but there was a period in my life where I was interested in the dramaturgy that happened like within the theatrical experience and a little bit going, because we were dramaturging plays in Canada like four years. And there's all, so that's all. Do that right, no one does that. Okay, sorry, and here I'm going to Jean Wong. Now, Jean Wong is an interdisciplinary director, curator, writer, and video artist of First Nations and Asian descent. Her works focus on obvious things like gender, class, and race, as well as things a little less obvious like gender, class, and race. Her <laughs> more recent works focus on indigenizing minds and spaces. She's an overall member of the TAC Cultural Leaders, Leaders Lab, where she is part of Revolution City, a project that seeks to center indi indigeneity in the city. She is a recipient of the 2014 Ken McDougall Director's Award. Close to my heart, because you know, mm -hmm. Ken McDougall is a great friend of mine. Uh, Jean is Artistic Director of Eventual Ashes, the community arts organization, Asian Arts Freedom School. Jen creates large-scale performance experiences that empower and elicit empathy. So are you working on such a project right now? I am, actually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, actually, just starting up a new piece um, right now, um, and I'm going to a meeting to it right after this this panel talk. Um, and uh, what we're doing, I'm working with this incredible um, choreographer, Aria Evans, and uh, we're creating a new site-specific immersive piece. Um, I'm actually writing the text for it, uh, and it's about indigenous cosmology. Cosmology? Mm -hmm. Wow. So, is it anything like astrology? No. Oh, no. No. <laughs> I figured it, it wouldn't be. I, I, no, but I'm very interested in Elizabethan astrology because it's something that I'm working on. And it's part of what I do when I think about Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. So I'd be fascinated to know if there were any linkages or anything. But anyway, we don't really have time to talk about it now. But, oh, yes, yes, but I am fascinated. We'll do that on the cosmology uh, panel someday. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, now, we have, not, last but not least, Nick Green is a Canadian actor and playwright. 
He won the Dora Mabur Moore Award for the Outstanding New Play in 2017 for his new play, Body Politic, a dramatization of the history of the Canadian LGBTQ magazine, The Body Politic. He is a graduate of the University of Alberta. His prior plays have included Gay Face, On the Wire, Undercovered, Coffee Dad, Chicken Mom, and the fabulous Buddha Boy, Under the Top, Under the Big Top, and Bearded Lady. And what you were telling me, but is that your major project that you're working on right now you were telling me about, or? No. Okay, what's your major project you're working on? Um, so, uh, I have a few things on the go. I just completed a workshop of a new play called Happy Birthday Baby Jay at Factory, which is about two parents raising a baby without a gender. Um, I'm also uh, in the Right From The Hip unit with Nightwood Theatre, co-writing a play with a playwright named Andrea Scott about um, Black Lives Matter and the Toronto Gay Pride Parade. Um, and uh, <coughs> I'm going into the Canadian Musical Theatre Projects at Sheridan, writing a crazy new musical. That will be the next Come From Away. That will apparently. be the next. Um, that's what I've heard. That's just the <laughs> rumors I've heard, because that, that Come From Away came from our own Sheridan. I don't know if you know that. The yeah. Musical Theatre, which just is able to just bash out those hit Broadway musicals. Quite a machine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A second. Okay, so thank you very much for that. So, um, I am just trying to sell ourselves to the Americans here. Sorry. So, I'm going to do a little, I'm an American though, so that's why I'm still loud and obnoxious. I'm from there, I have that whole pedigree. You can blame anything you don't like on me, on, you know, my background there. Um, now I'm Canadian, proud of it. Relinquish my citizenship, proud of it. But, um, so I'm just going to give a, I, I'm just going to sound horrible, but a very brief lecture on fictional, fictional identities that will try to make it clear. It shouldn't last more than about five minutes. Hopefully I'll try to talk slowly. Um, and then I would like to talk about my concept of fictional identities and just see if there's anything in what I say that makes you go, oh yes, oh no, you know what I mean, or that you want to flag and discuss. Um, so I'm going to start off by saying I'm definitely not an Aristotelian. That is a start. So that means, so, so if there are any Aristotelians in the room, if you're philosophers, then you won't like this. <laughs> because Aristotle's all about A is A, right? So a chair is a chair, an apple is an apple, a rock is a rock. You don't know that, you're nodding. So it's like, so I'm sort of going, uh-oh, he's one of those guys who doesn't think an apple is an apple. Yeah, you got me. I'm in the side of post-structuralists and someone also, Korbishki, who I've just, just, just uh, discovered who uh, what had a book, uh, a book uh, Ken Keyes has written a book that's sort of based on Korbishki, who basically think that we have to be careful of saying that something is something, and it has to do with identifying things. Why? Because our emotions, our prejudice, our, or differences as humans, our preconception, and most importantly, language itself, and the paradigms that are in our culture get in our way of understanding or just saying A is A. Um, so, yeah. So, Let's go, let's go right into theater. So hopefully we'll get a clearer view because we're all theater people. David Mamet came out with a book, I can't remember what it's called, so many, in the late 90s about acting. You're probably aware of it, in which he kind of expressed his theory of acting, which as I understand, I've tried to teach it with some success to my students. And it's about, you don't act anymore, or more precisely, you don't play a character, right? He was kind of like, in my interpretation of Mamet's most recent theory, which I think is accepted by a lot of American actors, or maybe something has now superseded it, but it was this notion that um, you just go on stage and you, you're yourself. You don't put on a mask and you express the emotions in the play. And you, you use yourself. Um, and if you want to see an example of it, go to Rebecca Pigeon in the various movies that his wife is in. And if you like Rebecca Pigeon, you may like, like the technique because she's doing it. Um, then there's what I call the opposite side, which is Simon Callow in London. And uh, he wrote a book called something. Maybe some of you have read it. What? Being an actor. That's right, being an actor, you know the book. And he talks about being a young uh, fag guy like me who was all ashamed in, in the closet like I was. And then he, theater was a mask that he wore. And he could hide himself. And it was all about, I'm not me. I'm someone else, right? This is all fiction, right? So I'm saying that those are two opposing views and they very much affect the way we think about theater, especially now because we have something called reality theater. This is what I call it. In Canada, you have people like Jordan Han Dan Tannehill, uh, sorry, what's his first, F oh, I'm, I'm blanking on, Yavi, Yavi Jane, right? Ravi. Ravi, sorry, Ravi Jane, Jacob Zimmer, who've all done theater like this. Um, 
And I would define reality theater, and I think it might be happening in the States too, or it might have just happened, maybe we're, oh, we're not behind the times, but at any rate, people get on stage, they play themselves, they talk, they improvise. No play, no art, no fakery, no fiction, just reality, right? Okay, so those, so to me, those two things are coming, so, and, and sometimes these people from that group, I've caught Jacob Zimmer on this, he said things like, well, um, I'm tired of that fake theater, I'm tired of theater with characters and plots and all that fake stuff. I want real theater about real people. Um, um, so the two are opposed, I'm saying, and it's kind of the Simon Callow, uh, David Mamet school. So whenever we get to my theory, I feel we live in a world which overvalues reality uh, in a very Aristotelian way and thinks we can get to it. So how does this apply to identity? Previously, in terms of identity and sexuality, there's been essentialism and constructionism. <coughs> Essentialists believe that our identities are biological, like male, female, gay, straight. We're born that way and it's biology. Constructionism believes that those identities are constructed. Uh, and and just, to, just to make up, just to get uh, very quickly, I'll talk to myself a bit as a drag queen and then I'll try to um, wrap up. I'm a drag queen, it's a made up identity. It tells a lot about me though. I'm an effeminate gay man who has constantly to deal with people being afraid, angry, upset by my femininity in real life. I have to stop doing this with my hands. Drag is a fictional identity, it's not real. It's not, that speaks to my daily experience of exclusion. Um, so, and I think, and there's an example of someone making up something about themselves that I think is more true than fact. I'm male, that's a fact, I have a penis, sorry to mention it, but I do. And so, but that's not really of much relevance to me as the way I perceive myself inside. I perceive myself as a boy or a girl, but not as a man. And drag helps, that, that fictional identity helps me with that. Uh, so I'm not, inter I'm interested in fictional identities. I'm interested in the idea that identity is fiction. I'm interested in the idea that, it's, that if you say I am uh, Italian, that's a good example. We may offend the Italians in the room. But, you know, it's, it doesn't mean anything and it means everything. So in other words, it means nothing in the sense that in reality, there are so many people who will say, you're not Italian, I'm Italian. You were born in Yugoslavia, you were, or you know, it's not now Italy. You're not Italian, I'm Italian. But the reality of being an Italian to that person who thinks they're Italian is incredibly important and it is real and it is fiction. And what is fictional is important and that's what art is based on. It's all about playing games, making up things. That's what theater is about. It's not about being real. Being real is kind of impossible. So when we talk about identity, we have to talk about, uh, we do need to talk about things like privilege, which is like, does that person get a grant? Is that person be, have prejudice against them under the law? And that has to do with what privilege people have, and that has a lot to do with the way they look, right? And that's very important, we must discuss that. But I'm suggesting separating that from something called identity. And then we will stop accusing people, which I think is the mean part, of not being that, saying you're not Italian. You're Italian, I'm Italian. <laughs> We're different kinds of Italians. We have different concepts of Italianness. And let's not get into a culture war, or worse, what happens around identity issues, a war war, and hurt each other. My little lecture. So, does anybody have anything to say about it? Are you, <laughs> are you all Aristotelians? Or do you think that I've gone in the wrong direction with this fictional idea, or? Um. No, no, I don't think you're going in the wrong direction. I go. Would you? Do you uh, have a thing? I, I don't know if it's yes or no, wrong direction. Right, that's, that's like, definitely yeah. about the wheels. Did you want to modify or anything in what I said or want to question? Yeah. So, um, so I'm uh, Jamaican. My mother's Jamaican. Uh, I'm mixed race, which inv includes uh, black, South Asian white, uh, a variety of things, like a veritable martini shaker of a human being. Um, and so, but people perceive me as white, perhaps, as I've gotten Greek, I've gotten um, uh, Latinx, I've gotten very, but never Jamaica. Like, very rarely, only other people from Jamaica would ever read me as that particularly. So. There's something else, I think, a layer in this idea of fictional identities, which is the pressure of external, which impacts how I am able to access my Jamaican identity. And where privilege comes into that 
is that I have a privilege of choosing whether or not to reveal right. my Jamaican identity. So I do it a lot, like it's sort of ingrained in me, but I do walk through the world with a choice of identifying as Jamaican, and does that make me identify as a person of color? I'm like, and I actually do question that every day in spaces as to what I am being perceived as. So it is a question of both my internal identity. Do I, like, I was um, talking to a friend of mine, Audrey Dwyer, about how I would look in the mirror for a long time and try to figure out whether or not I looked white. And she said, well, white people don't do that. No. <laughs> um, and I'm like, true. True. So there is something internal in me that, that is delineating me away from whiteness as a center, but is that how I am being perceived? And that's where the privilege lays in, is that I can, in certain circles, pass as white I because of how I'm being perceived. And so I think the other layer is the societal, societal expectation and what we can, how we can move within our fictional identities. How much access do I have for the identities which are internal in myself? to be external, and I actually think that's where the theater is, is in bringing these identities into spaces where they are accepted or not accepted. And, and that cognitive dissonance almost that, that can appear when I think I am walking to, into a space as one thing and I'm received as another, that fascinates me, like utterly fascinates me. Um, and it's something like, and because of the, the person that I am, and like, that's even before I'm thinking about whether or not people perceive me as queer, which I also genuinely don't know. Like, I also could look like any straight woman walking down Queen West. I mean, like, fashion is, is really fluid right now. So, uh, so, uh, so there's all these layers of how I am feeling I'm being perceived, and that's where my internal drama comes from, is in navigating that. Got it. I mean, I, I, I know that, for instance, to me, it reminds me a little bit of being a straight acting gay man, which I would never not know about because I'm not one, but they have a choice, you know what I mean? Whereas us, us uh, queens don't, but they have a choice because they, uh, they don't have, if they tell people, they'll know, right? And they're sometimes surprised. With me, it's usually right. They kind of figured out you were gay. Yes, but then, like, in that, in that choice, there is also... Um, a burden and a shame of like if I don't right if yes. I choose not to reveal this then maybe it could just come up yes. like and a fear <laughs> or whatever out of out of or uh, yeah or maybe then I was lying right like that's a big reason why I don't talk to anyone I went to high school with is to have to deal with the idea that they would think I was lying for four years when I wasn't out right right I just didn't know I right. have no idea at that point. Right. I thought it was very interesting that someone came to me Someone sent me this weird letter because of an article I wrote. You get weird things, right? And it said, um, should you ask a person if they're gay? And the implication was, if they are gay, should you ask them? But basically, it was basically, should you ask a person if they're gay? And I said, in terms of gayness, in terms of my politics, yes. If more people had asked me if I was gay when I was young, it would have helped me, though it would have been very torturous. It would have been dangerous, it would have been felt unsafe in many ways, but it meant that I would have gone, gay, <gasps> I'm not gay, and it would have made me start to deal with it. I don't agree that someone should say, you're gay or you're a faggot, but I think you're allowed to ask the question, are you gay? In my view, that's my own opinion. Anyway, I've jumped to another topic here. Does anybody else want to talk about this? What you look like you do? Yeah, I do. Go ahead. Okay, I guess I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, for me, uh, in, in hearing sort of the conversation, uh, it gets me thinking about um, actually sort of delineating what identification is and the reasons to identify or self-identification. Uh, um, and Mel touched a bit on it, uh, whether it's an external thing or an internal thing. Uh, and for me, uh, one of the things I think about immediately is, uh, is someone self-identifying as something uh, uh, or not self-identifying as a means of survival. You know, uh, and uh, um, I think about um, uh, you know here in Canada we have the Indian Act, uh, uh, where a government is basically externally saying who is indigenous and who is not, uh, and so many generations of people who um, you know uh, did not identify as indigenous as a means of survival, 
right, uh, in order to uh, avoid various oppressions and discriminations. <laughs> Um, and you know that happens in queer communities too, yeah. as you just touched upon, with people who can choose to identify as straight or queer. Um, and um, um, you know, there's that kind of identification, uh, but there's also this identification of, of being true to your heart and, and who you are inside, right? And that's not really fictional to me, right? Um, uh, that's that's actually getting in touch with 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 your with your inner self, with your uh, blood memory, with your ancestors, or whatever it is. Those kind of connections. That's a whole different type of identification, uh, 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 which um, isn't fictional. But you see, that's where I would go. Hey, this is why I tried to push because I'm I'm actually my real advocacy, <laughs> even though I'm this queer artist, which is true, is art. I mentioned queer stuff, but I'm actually advocating for art. Which means to me, I think art is more important than life. Mm. I'm fucked, I'm fucked. I live in art. It's where I live, right? So for me, anything that you've made up is probably more real. I know that sounds like me just non-Aristotelian wanking off. But in fact, I honestly believe that what's in your heart is fictional. But it, not your heart, but what's in my heart, you have whatever's in your heart. But I think what's in, I'm not going to tell you what's in your heart, but what's in my heart is fictional, because I have all sorts of ideas about who I am. But it's so important. And it's real, it's real, art is, needs to be reacted to. It needs to be taken seriously. It needs to be, like our images of ourselves that we project, Oscar Wilde said it, he was a very deep man, the mask is more important than the truth. Um, and anyway, so that's but that, all I want to say was, I, by saying fictional, I'm not trying to diminish it in any way. I valorize fiction. Like, I think that that's the point, is that when people go around saying this is real, they're devaluing real, because then people end up getting to arguments about what's real, and sometimes they're impossible to figure out, because everybody's got facts on the reality side, on different sides, right? But, um, but um, anyway, that's all, that's all I would say, but that's still, but I know that people go fiction, so you're just saying, hey, it's fiction, you know, but, uh, and that's devaluing, but, do you want something else? Not on that? Oh, move on to Nick. I'm really nervous talking. <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of really smart people in here. Oh, and, come on. And, um, so I'm, <laughs> I'm going to talk about my, uh, it, so I read your paper. Oh, um, God, so that means you're smart. Well, <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, and um, I can talk about my response to your paper as well as what I explore in terms of identity in my work. I'm no expert on identity, but... I'll just mention your work that you, oh, you... Oh, sorry, you mean your theater work? My theater work. Okay, fine. I also have a background in social work. Um, so, in your paper, something I, that stood out to me were two things. One is the sort of use of the word fictional identity as opposed to gender performance, in a way. Right. We sort of yes. departed from yes. Butler's uh, notion of gender performance, talked about it as fictional identity. And also where you referenced Foucault in terms of uh, discourse existing, you know, philosophically, but also having material consequences in some contexts, right? So the discourse of justice has a material consequence in prison. And I think that is where a lot of my interest in part in the discussion about identity lies. In terms of identity can be philosophical, it can be intellectual, but ultimately it has material consequences and that's where discussion of privilege comes in. Yeah. And a lot of my focus, for instance, has been on masculinity um, and the performance or fictionalization of masculinity is one thing that isn't real, that is performed, is fictional, but has incredible material consequences and to my mind is performed um, in attempts to access power and and so much about identity or fictional identity to me has to be discussed within relation to the center or the power so I'm a femi gay guy too I, I mean um, I can Butch it up, but even then, I seem then I seem like a slightly straight passing femi gay guy. <laughs> um, but uh, and so I experience pain and I experience oppression in some contexts. But there's also the possibility of me using that fictionalized performance as a way of accessing power by oppressing women. And so um, to me, and in theater, if you're going to be 
uh, exploring that fictional world of identity, to me it's about responsibility of understanding that, post-structurally speaking, what is fake and what is presented to the world as, you know, a fake identity has consequences and has a context that has to be observed. Because once you put it out there, it, it starts the process of becoming material. Okay. Um, now that was... Now, first of all, you just casually cited Foucault. <laughs> He's What's doing a Shakespearean rhetorical technique. It's all through Shakespeare. What the orator does is they start by saying, I'm stupid. And, I'm <laughs> and don't listen to me because I really don't matter much. And then they proceed to be eloquent. No, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, but you've moved us into an area that I wanted to talk about, which was appropriation. Now, I did want to open it up, so I know it isn't time yet, but how do I know how when to open it up? I'll, you Will you tell me? How much time do you want for questions? I don't know, at least. 20 minutes, okay. do we have an hour and 15 or yeah. something? So at least 20 minutes, maybe longer, but okay. see where you are. Okay, um, so I think, I, I think we just slide right into appropriation. So I'll tell you that I, I right now am, because um, you talked a little bit about the privilege of putting on certain masks and how, it, and how that's related to power. Um, and I think that, well, I'll, I'll, I'll cite you two anecdotes. Um, one of them is um, trying to read a play by Amurai Baraka at my very white school, right? So I, my school has almost no people of color now, sort of, but you're, when I was teaching this 10 years ago, no people of color. So there are white students sitting around the class and I make them study, I'm a big admirer of Amrai Baraka, Leroy Jones, so I make them study Dutchman. So um, I wanted to read that aloud in class and I had one of the students say, we can't read that aloud. And I said, why? And they said, nobody in the class is black. And so for me as a teacher, it was a moment of going, hey, we have two choices. We can either not see what it's like to hear Amy Baraka's voice, or we can um, hear it and not be black people reading it, right? So that's an issue. For, and I thought it was an interesting issue. The other issue is, um, I'm thinking now, and I'm mentioning your opinion on this, I'm teaching now, I'm thinking of teaching Rana Bo Rihanna Boy something, I can't remember 95. the last letter, 95, by Jordan Tannehill, since he's a hot player and everybody loves him. So he's got this monologue um, that he's written for a young black man. And when I read it, it's, it's as far as I understand, it's for a young black man who's a drag queen and who thinks he's Rihanna, or, or at least wants to perform as Rihanna. Uh, for me, total identity in terms of like drag queen, right? Like that's my experience of being a drag queen. It's my experience of identity. But it's also Jordan Tannehill writing a play about being a young black man. So do I teach that? Should he write that? That's my question. Am I going to get into trouble with some people for teaching it? Not that that's a stupid issue. Let's just say it this way. Should we? Is it right? Is it, is it just? How do we deal with that? How do we deal with Jordan and his play? <laughs> 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 I know. I mean, I think when you, you talked about, to, what, did, what did Thompson say? What did you say that Thompson Oh, said? Thompson's quote that I always repeat, because it, 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 he knows that I do it. I'm sure I've told him I do I know. He knows I do this. But is what, when I asked him about um, appropriation, about because Thompson Harry is, is, is a great, wonderful writer and indigenous person, and he, uh, I asked him about a CBC program where a, a white guy was writing about residential schools. And I said, "What do you think of that?" And he went, <laughs> so "To a Thompson invitation," but it was like, you know, well, he can do what he wants, but he might get it wrong. <laughs> so that was that is actually the tack that I take, but I don't know if people agree with that tack or not. See, I would modify that. Is okay. that you can do what you want, you might get it wrong, and you might be critiqued. You might be punished for it with you a might public flogging. Well, but I yeah. don't know about public flogging, <laughs> yeah. but I mean, you might have to have co have some difficult conversations yeah. and yeah, critique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I think that a lot of the times, um, writers will come to me and ask if they're allowed to write yeah. in yeah. a certain voice, if they're allowed to, and I don't know what permission I could give them. I'm not here to give you permission <laughs> to write in any specific voice. What I am here to help you do is to navigate the, con the inevitable conversations that will happen if you do write in this specific voice. So, Jordan, were he here, I would say that, well, we should have a conversation about appropriation of black voice. Mm -hmm. And he should be able to have a very intelligent conversation about appropriation of black voice. Perhaps why he chose to write this character. Perhaps um, be open to people saying, I, do I don't think this is real. I don't think this is, like, right. as you say. And then, but that doesn't mean that the play can't exist. <laughs> that doesn't mean that he can't write. Like, it's actually that 
there's this, this, you know, and I know that online critiques and like, it can be quite rabid and quite intense. <laughs> But I think what people are looking for when they ask that question of, can you write this about that? Am I allowed to write this about that? Is they're actually looking for a permission that doesn't exist. But I remember when we did um, Robin Fulford's play, Still Kiss, which was one of the hugest hits that Buddy's ever had. It was about straight guys beating up a gay man in a park. And it was written by a straight guy. You know? And it was about, you know, it was lots of gay men in it, right? And Robin Fulford, in my view, got it, right? And I didn't care whether he would. And I was actually hard to find gay plays. At that time, I was beating the bushes to find gay plays. Mm -hmm. And um, we did it. And um, anyway, so I'm just saying that for me was the thing, was that, and I, and I viewing it as a gay man, a lot of their gay men, so I didn't come out of it going, gay men never act like that, you know? But he also was yes. writing straight characters, right? Yeah, because he was writing, the, he was very good at writing the bully, the, the violent bullies, too. And so, so there is actually, like, an identity position that he might share, like with yes, the world that's right, that's play, right? That's a good right? Point. So that's that, good point. so that, like, especially when we're coming into plays about, like, say, people of color, because this comes up a lot when we talk about appropriation of the stories of people of color. Like, maybe there is a responsibility of white playwrights to also handle whiteness within the context of these plays, and not just, and not just consider, am I accurately portraying the people of color? Because that's not going to happen. Sorry, what's the other responsibility then? Sorry. Um, as they're as responsible for giving us like, like um, investigations of whiteness and okay. how that operates within a context, as opposed to seeing whiteness as this neutral place and focusing all of their energy on the like other, That's the very like that that is the that is the thing that needs to be authentic is the other. I'm like, well, what about like whiteness is a cultural construct, like yeah. and and needs to be like studied and and given as much of a like. Culture, like it, we're always focusing on whether you're appropriating the culture of the other and doing that, like as you say, in real. Like, is it real? That I find that people of color actually have a very difficult time writing people of color because they're so worried about that their representation will be seen as the authentic one. Like, if a black playwright writes a black character, that's the authentic one. No, no, no. It's one human beings with possibly some experience that may cross over with the character that they're writing, but. If anything, they are as, if not more, beholden to a lot of the stereotypes that have been pulled in of narrative well, stories. Well, one of the one of the justifications that one of my uh, fellow writing instructors at Guelph uses and has been used online by people writing about this is um, <coughs> writing is by definition a mask. You have to put on a mask to write. If you say you should not put on a mask to write then you are going against writing. I'm just being devil's advocate here. I'm playing that argument that I've heard, right? Um, so you're actually, you're actually being anti-creative. So I'm being hard line here. If you say, be careful, don't put on a mask, because that's kind of something you shouldn't probably ethically do. And that's a bit of what I'm going back to my fictional identities. It is about masks. I'm talking about wearing masks a little bit. And I'm talking about, uh, don't we sort of cut away? Now, you aren't suggesting that people don't. You agreed that, basically with Thompson, you just said, put it out in the marketplace, and secondly, for, for discussion, and also let's hear about white people, too, if they're writing a white play. So I get that. You're not saying don't, 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 anyway. But I'm just, I'm just talking about this extreme position, anyway. I don't know if I'm, I'm saying that whiteness is not a neutral position. Yeah, and that's that, very important. Uh, that, like, that, that, that energy needs to be put towards not seeing it as a, like, a neutral center and then everything else outside of that is the other. Mm -hmm. That it's a very specific choice, as a matter of fact. And, um, no, I lost it. There was something you said about, it, like, about responsibility, about, mm -hmm. like, um, and that the other side of, of, of writing that I think is kind of scary now, but I think very important, is that there is a responsibility for what we put on stage, for what we are creating. Because theater, I mean, for me, and obviously I'm someone who has studied theater, but when we go back to different time periods in our history, we look at the art that was created and we think of that as a reflection of the narrative of the time. So the work that we're creating today, will people will look back and think of it as a reflection of what we are now and the narrative of our time. And I think that's a that's a really important responsibility as artists.
think especially um, when tackling something that has like a historical, uh, well, everything we write has a historical context, right? But I think in terms of like writing a play about the residential schools or something that's happened, um, the responsibility falls within understanding what lens you're bringing to it. And Mel, if I'm picking up on what you're talking about, it's, it's that a white writer writing a story that is sort of central to, um, say, a racialized community, um, the responsibility falls within examining what lens you're placing <coughs> on it. And that if I were to write that story about residential schools, um, my lens has to be examined within that play rather than I masquerading as this is a account of what happened that, that is accurate and indisputable, right? Um, yes, that's, that's exactly. what, And that's what histori historiography is, as opposed to history. It's looking critically at history and saying maybe what we know as history is actually just someone's story that comes from a particular point of view. Well, and, I mean, I think it's important as Canadians, like, if we are, like, if I, as a settler, am writing a play about uh, the residential schools for some reason, um, that I have a responsibility to really examine how the settlers around in that in that play are affecting this as well. Like it's not about like that. There's a there's a, a national guilt and shame that needs to be examined within that story. That is that is. Uh, I don't know. Well, what, what, I, what I notice in a lot of plays around drag and effeminate men is that they are often not white in plays. In other words, the character that is effeminate is not white. You find it in Angels in America, it drives me crazy, right? And so if in Rihanna Boy, if he had inserted a young drag white guy, do you know what I mean? And what is that person, how does that person react with the young drag black boy? Do you know what I mean? Like how, 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 is there another, you know, so there's, there's a possibility of looking at his own, being critical of his own cultural thing rather than pretending it's just the norm. I think that's one of the things we're talking about. I think um, um, when it comes to conversations of appropriation, uh, what I think about is um, uh, that for so many uh, uh, millennia on this land, it's um, uh, about relationships, it's about community, it's about uh, where you're from. And uh, uh, in that, um, there's a responsibility uh, and there's accountability to particular people with particular communities. Uh, so uh, <laughs> for me, for example, um, um, when I'm creating work um, or directing work or doing any kind of work, um, uh, um, uh, uh, I have to ask my grandmothers, I have to ask my elders, uh, I have to ask my community um, for permissions, you know, what can I be shown, what can I share, what cannot be. Uh, and um, if there's a whole protocol to that, to, to be able to go to, to, to do these things. Uh, and uh, for me, that's something that's ingrained in me. You know, that's something that I know I have to do. Uh, and um, uh, I think um, uh, when it comes to these things where people decided to write about things that are not of their own culture, um, the question becomes, who are you accountable to? Who are you responsible to? So when Thompson says, uh, hey, you can write about it, but if you get it wrong, who are you responsible to when you're wrong? Mm -hmm. you know, who are you accountable to? And that's where the problem is, because when uh, someone is wrong, there's no accountability. Right? They can just go off and, you know, within this world, continue to do things. And that's where there's a problem. Uh, uh, and that's where you know, a lot of the, uh, uh, the critique comes, the emotion comes, right, when you haven't done that. Uh, and um, I think something that's also really important is that like, to have those relationships where you're responsible and accountable to somebody or a community, it takes time. It's not something that you can just start and then you know, in a couple months start writing something. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's where the problems come because we're in such a rush rush society that often that's mm -hmm. how it happens and that just increases the chances of being wrong. Well, I realize that race is different than sexuality. We'll start with that. But when I was writing some of my, when I've written some of my, some of my early novels were about very much about the details of the gay life. Being a slut, meaning being promiscuous. And I got a sense from some gay men that it was like, and still I think this is true, and I'd say magnified by like a thousand percent, but back then it was even like, why are you telling our secrets? 
this is, these are the secrets of our culture. Like, for instance, I talked about bear culture, when nobody really knew about bear culture. And I was critical of bear culture, because it's actually, as, like all fiction, it's as silly as it is wonderful, and as mean as it is kind. Do you know what I mean? It's just full of contradictions. But, um, but I knew people were like, and I had <coughs> some straight friends, but I've never heard of this bear thing. There's this whole bear thing <laughs> in the gay community. Yeah, it's pretty big. And, um, and they're, they are pretty big. But uh, yeah, but then I would have some gay men who'd be saying, I don't think straight people should know that. So it's interesting. And I think around sexuality, in my sexuality sometimes, I feel like those secrets should be, I'm not saying it should be revealed in your case, but I'm saying it's interesting because in my culture, then maybe I'm wrong because people get mad at me, but I'm feeling like, hey, we have to kind of put it out there a bit. Though sometimes it also leaves us a bit defenseless, people feel. That's one of the other problems, because I feel we can be attacked, because you've revealed how the culture works. You've revealed what goes on inside the culture. Right? It's very interesting to me, at any rate. Um, so, um, does anybody have anything else to say about that? Subject? Well, that just makes me think, too. <laughs> like, looking at theater, so often my big question when I walk out of something is, what is the point of that play existing, right? <laughs> like, and so, well, well no, yes. sometimes, oh, right? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's commercial theater that you're like, right. that exists because it was fun and it makes me feel good, right? <laughs> and, it, it, and a lot of that commercial theater makes me feel good because I'm a white middle class person, right? Male. So I can relate with that. I see a love story of people who look like me and makes me feel good. I walk out, right? A play about bear culture, or I think of also, say, a play, what was it called? Um, it was about the pausing culture. Yes. Pig. Pig. I, I, that's a subculture. Bear. The pause, now, pause, so people know what pausing is? It's gay men who try to, it's this partial fiction, partial reality of gay men who want to be HIV positive, who want to be given a gift of the... HIV positivity. Anyway. A very visceral play, yeah. this, this yeah. one. It was a British play called Very Bear. difficult to watch, mm -hmm. for me. And, uh, or bear culture at a certain time. Now I think they'd probably, there could be a musical. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, right, right, I go see that. Um, but, uh, but what is the point of this play existing? What are we doing in, in presenting this identity, this performance to people, what's the point, and what's the audience? And I think something that stands out to me about this discussion of um, appropriation responsibility, someone writes a play about a different culture or community and casts their lens on it. My big question too is what's the audience? Because if that play is then going to have a run in a house where the subscription base is 90% white people, then there is no responsibility because ultimately the community wasn't even engaged in the telling of that story. So that play exists, people learn, they leave, they have the information through a white lens, and the damage is done, in my opinion, in that case. So, this, um, uh, so in terms of telling our secrets, who are you telling our secrets to and why? Like, what's the point? That's where my question comes up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Period. <laughs> yeah, no, I, t I, I, I totally get that. Um, how are we doing for time? Uh, we've got about half an hour left. Oh my god. Oh, we've got half an hour left. Yes. Yeah, not before the discussion period. Yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah, so I can't remember what I was going to say, but I had an idea about all that. Now it's gone. Um, so um, I think that so when, we, when we talk about one other topic that we're going to talk about, which we'll just briefly touch on, is um, um, casting. So in terms of non-traditional casting, I'm wondering whether, um, if you guys have any opinions on where we are. Oh yeah, oh sorry, this is the comment I wanted to make. Sorry, it leads into this a little bit, okay? And I, th I think we have to look at the fact that we, we are here at the LMDA conference, and who cares about us except us? Now I may be wrong, and I mean that about theater in general. Uh, just listen to me for one second. But I know, because there's this huge thing called the Cult, the, what do we call it? The cult, the, the, the mega computer uh, commercial theater, commercial uh, musicals, what's online. There's the capitalist culture all around us, making money, which we're not doing. We're not, I'm not in it for the money. This capitalist culture absolutely is weighing upon us. And people still have an attitude of, 
your plays aren't being very well attended. Why are you doing it? You know, if you were successful, you'd be making money. Like Garth Drabinsky, who was ar arrested. Are you aware of Garth Drabinsky? Yeah. And anyway, he was a big producer, Canadian producer, who went to the States. And I always used to be told, why don't you make some money from your work? And they'd say, Garth Drabinsky <coughs> makes money from his work. He's now in jail because he's a criminal. That's how he made money from his Broadway shows. But um, so what I'm saying is that you have this incredible culture, which is incredibly oppressive, which is straight and white, and it's all about money, and it, they don't give a shit about political correctness, especially in the age of you-know-who, whose name I'm not going to mention, right? And here we are, disc I'm not, I shouldn't use the word political correctness, but here we are discussing very important issues, and sometimes I just go, not that we shouldn't discuss them, but I just go, God, aren't we rigorous on ourselves? And out there, they can do anything they want, and they will laugh at us, and they will be angry at us for even bothering thinking about it. Right? I just think it's important to be aware of that, right? That there, there is a vast capitalist culture um, that goes, hey, who cares? You wankers, you playwrights. Playwrights are still figures of fun in movies. You go watch a movie and, and you will find that oftentimes the character, that when they're trying to represent a nerdy intellectual who has no relationship to the world, they'll go, oh, he's a playwright. <laughs> and that in itself is a laugh, right? Um, okay, so... Um, I just wanted to, I don't know if anybody has anything to say about that, but for me it's a difficult question. Like, on the one hand, we can't, I don't want to hold back on us, but I mean, there are people like Delmar who talk about how we sometimes kill ourselves. Like, we, we're so critical of each other in the world that is, that is trying to create art or being lefty or just being opposed to capitalist culture that we kind of, um, that we're ineffectual because we're so busy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just think it's something to think about. Um, not, not that we shouldn't be critical of each other, we shouldn't be rigorous with each other, <laughs> but there's a whole world that's not rigorous at all. And they're winning. They win every day, right? Oh, sorry. I think that depends how you define winning. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, well, you see, if you see, like, yeah, that's a good making point. mega money as winning, but I'm sure they're winning. That's absolutely true. But that doesn't mean that that play is more valuable than a play that had a small audience and, and didn't make great returns, but, but changed some opinions or, or represented some people or... Well, you're speaking to the uh, converted, I believe in small. I'm a big, I'm a big thing of 10 people saw my play. Hey, it's a start. <laughs> I love my play, they loved it, you know what I mean? Uh, so we, I was going to start to talk a little bit about, um, but does anybody have any feelings about where we are in the world of non-traditional casting? Because I feel that one of the problems, uh, the, the, the thing that I want to discuss was I've been told, well, this is the way you deal with non-traditional casting, which used to be called um, colorblind casting, and it can also refer to gender too, um, is that what you do is you, if it's a play which is old and has no politics, then you are free, like usually Shakespeare's thought of in this category, or perhaps Shaw, though that's, I don't know, Noel Coward, maybe. Uh, so, you know, you can do non-traditional casting. But if you're doing a play about the Deep South and racism, unless you want to make a particular point about being non-traditionally casting, and to have the play be about your non-traditional casting, you're in fact going to probably have white people play white people and black people play black people, because it's about whites oppressing blacks, and the white should be white in that play, and the black should be black. So I'm, I'm wondering if you guys have an opinion about that. Is that, is that a valid theory of non-traditional casting? Does it work, or is it... I think I think that the central the central tenant of colorblind or non-traditional casting is still with whiteness as a neutral choice, and anything made outside of that choice is 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 the political choice. And so I think casting Shakespeare all white is a political choice, actually. And I don't think that like um, uh, you know, and Philip Aiken at Obsidian Theater talks a lot about deracialized casting, where you are casting a Shakespeare play with people of color, but they are not playing people of color. They're playing that character in this particular British court and they have to like, you know, kind of war take their mind away from all of the things that are making, <laughs> that they're bringing on stage simply through their presence as a person of color on that stage. So, but I don't get that. So that doesn't that suggest that you... Black body on stage in a Shakespeare play. Oh no, I get that. Yes. But I'm just saying, does that mean then that you, that you don't want to cast people of color in not Anything if it's that's in, not, not a play about people of color. No, not if okay. it's not if it's not if it's not thought about, and it's only seen as antithetical to, oh well, we don't want to do something boring, so let's bring in people of color, and then maybe that'll inherently make it interesting. But if you don't let the people of color actually impact 
like through their bodies, through their like the story that is being told on stage, then it's just. But maybe then what I'm complaining about is something good because I would say, hey, you often have the black effeminate guy. Well, you're doubling his otherness. Your extension that would seem to fit your as a positive thing, your theory, because if you cast the black guy as the effeminate guy, then he's got. You're accentuating his otherness of being effeminate by being of color, and that's a good thing because that's using that. Is that see what I mean? And I don't know if I agree with that. See, it's a, it's a. I mean, I think I would have to know more details about right. the play. Like an example that I have is when uh, a production cast uh, Aaron as a black man, but also cast one of Titus Andronicus's son as a black man, and so then all of a sudden Aaron's um, whole thing about being like a slave and being, you know. Uh, held down by Titus Andronicus and his family is kind of muddied by the fact that now Titus has black sons. Like, so, so all of a sudden this thing where he's like, okay, like I'm, I can bring, like he, had, he was going to wear Malcolm X glasses and he was going to, you know, like really bring the, all of a sudden it gets muddy because he's talking to another black guy. And he's like, so all, of, so it, so it seemed like, oh look, we're going to have lots of, but it actually cut, undercut his conceit. You know, I, I totally get that. I'm just worried that if you, and I know that, that if you are thinking about race constantly in terms of casting and what the effect that it has, and maybe this is a racist thing for me to say, then you are going to end up with every place about that. Maybe it should be, <laughs> but I don't know. Do you understand what I mean? Well, because people are, going, are saying, think about this. Don't think about the play. That's not what you're saying. You're saying it feeds into the play. I'm saying it feeds into the play, and it's right. an entire other layer of, okay. of, yeah. of, of tension, of history, of grounding, that is so critical to the play itself, actually. Right. Yeah. It's not what the play is about. It's what the play's foundation is. Mm -hmm. And like sometimes that could be race, sometimes that could be gender, sometimes that could be sexuality. But like if we ignore this foundation and just think of the play as something we can I don't know, put on air. Like, like it's, it's, the, it's the stage, like well, it's the stage. It's interesting because then, and I know we're going to open up to the audience, but it, it, to me this brings up a play that I was just in, involved with, uh, which was an adaptation of Vedicans Lulu, which was very much about saying, we don't want to listen, we don't want to hear these stories anymore. We don't want to hear any stories about women being raped. We do not want to have those stories, do not want to view them. That's kind of what the play was about, right? I didn't write it, but someone else did, but I was in it. But so that's to me interesting and, and part of this kind of discussion. Like, are the classics kind of over, or do they always need, because of the fact that they hold so much baggage, do they need to be constantly re examined? Is that what it is when we throw them in front of people? Should we never do a play before 19, 2000, maybe, that is not but critically, that we're, unless we're being critical of it and ripping it apart? Okay, well, there's well, stuff to feed on. Oh, and then we have to move on. Go ahead. Yeah. Did you want to say anything about the casting? Uh, go ahead. I think that what's standing out to me in listening to Mel is, is that there's a difference between being thoughtful in non-traditional casting and uh, erasing okay. race. Yeah. Okay. And okay. to me, sense? I have yeah. a question about a play that you can interchange people racially and there's not a political context to that because there's never been a time when race isn't political. So. If there is that play that it's so easy to, you know, substitute in and out different people based on their race, that and it's not political, I have a big question about what that play is and why it's being produced today. <laughs> yeah. Like, who cares? And I mean, I have my stance on classical theater, um, but again, the, the theater that interests me has value beyond just being a, a trip to the past. Um, and so what is that play where race is I think that's a very good not question. important or political? Yes. So the, the premise that if it's not political, you can do non-traditional casting is like, well, it is political if you're doing non, and if yeah. you erase that, you're just erasing that race or important. identity or whatever it is. Yeah, and, we and, and back to your sort of, you, going back to this black effeminate character, I think where my issue is, is if that character is the same, disregarding race, then I have questions about how that character is created. Right, I see what you're saying. Yeah. 
I mean, I think we're supposed to, op we should open we it are, up. Yes. Okay, sorry about that. So I know there's some stuff left to say in the panel, but I hate picking people. You're up, you're up front with the lovely brown hair. So will you speak? Um, all right, so I would love to hear you all comment on this conversation I have with my students all the time, which is coming from this question about fictional versus reality, where you started with the mammoth Simon Cowell model of acting. Um, Given that in contemporary theater performance and, and in the culture at large, I think we see modes of performance that are about playing a fiction, a fictional role. There is a role that's been created, I'm gonna play that, right? Versus about playing myself or a version of myself, right? And putting that into the world, right? Um, I, don't, I don't know how to navigate anymore the conversations I'm having around uh, a demand that within the context of fictional performance, right, a created world, a fictional play, right, that the people you cast to play the roles have to have had the life experiences that the characters have. Exactly. Right, they have to have those experiences, they have to be that person all day. And I'm like, now I understand this part of, of our field and our culture, it's important, I'm not devaluing it. But given that in our uh, culture and our field, we are going to do some work where we are creating fictional identity, we're putting on masks, right? right? Um, the demand that people who perform those roles are those people actually, to, to me, an anti-theatrical argument. It, okay. negates, it negates theater. I it's actually very... the argument that Tertullian made, it's actually the argument that, you know, it goes that back. Collier made, that they're saying, you cannot make theater because theater is a lie. You're not allowed to be. Oh, yeah, this theater. argument about lying and truth yeah. is inimical yeah. to theater has been going on for centuries. So anyway. I don't know what to do about that, given that I also am certainly sensitive to the vast yeah. need to uh, open up casting, right, to have people, <laughs> um, you know, non gender conforming uh, trans actors, people of color be getting way more opportunities, people getting to express themselves through masks they play because we do. We yeah, no, ourselves no, I get it. As well. I get that as well. Okay. <laughs> what, do, what do you think of this? <laughs> this? Well, is this, is, this a, is this a straw man she's setting up? Sorry, I'm, or is this a real question? Do we, do we think that we really have, that this is an issue of, that we have to re choose with whether or not a person has had that experience or not to play it? Or is it, a, what, is it an important issue? Go ahead, Gene. No, oh, you go, you go. Yeah, well, I think um, my, my, as a director, my first reaction to that is that, you know, um, uh, these days I think that rehearsal times are really short. You know, <laughs> we just don't have enough rehearsal time. So um, if someone has that lived experience in some way, it just makes it so much easier. And if someone doesn't, it takes way more rehearsal time that isn't there, you know, and uh, you can see that on the stage. Uh, the difference mm -hmm. right away. I mean, I would, uh, the, what I would say about it, add to that is that I've been kind of been using that and it hasn't had anything to do with race or sexuality for years as a director in the sense that I've always gone, what is the primary feature of this character? Like, what is it they're going to have to play more than anything? Are they just the angriest person in the earth, on, on the world, on, in the earth? So then that, I want an anger. I want a person who <laughs> angers right there. You say hello to them and go, what the fuck? You know, I want that kind of person to play that part. I don't want somebody to have to go, can we find your anger? And they're going, oh, my anger is there somewhere. I don't know. I'm not afraid of being angry. No, you know, and then you're in fucking trouble, right? Like you want people who can access what is important about that character. So you have to, and I usually make an intuitive response, an intuitive reading of what is the most important aspect of that character. And I'm drawn to that actor who can do that. And then I don't have to teach them that. So. That to me is related to some degree. Do you know what I mean? Like that. You have your hand up. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Amy Brooks wrote that theater she her hers. Um, I'm glad that you acknowledge the the vast capitalism that we're all working <laughs> under because that's a really important factor. So my question for you, uh, as a white artist who elects to put on these masks as needed uh, to convey the story to marginalized communities, people of color, um, and uh, examples in. Uh, how are your portrayals of your creativity benefiting those communities materially, financially? <laughs> and uh, also, how do we read that um, in a world like I have to cite American Info? I'm sorry, I don't have Canadian statistics, but like the life expectancy of, say, 
um, uh, black trans woman. He's 34 years old in the United States. How is this creativity of anything and the countries to portray that community? Are you talking to me? He's white artists. Uh, it's a panel, but I think it's mostly your words on the And uh, what difference does it make when we know that the American nonprofit here overwhelmingly serves the 15% whitest, best educated? Well, I mean, for, in my view, any kind of representation of difference is to some degree valuable, especially if it is abhorred by a lot of people. So, well, <laughs> well, in my view, though, racism and sexism and homophobia are different. There is enough within them that is similar that it serves in my view. Like, I mean, I, I, I can't, when I go to see a play about racism, I read myself into it sometimes, as we all do, right? And say, I felt abject because of this, because of my own reasons why I feel abject, right? So to me, I'm not saying that they're the same, but I'm saying if you're dealing with abjectness, you know, Judith Butler's favorite word, if you're dealing with that, then you can deal with it um, in many ways, and they are connected. And I think it's very important not to disconnect them, to say they're not the same, they're not the same, but to not to disconnect them and say, we're warring groups, right? That we have different interests, because we do share our abjectness. They may be different degrees of abjectness, the, the details of them, do you understand what I mean? No, I mean, I, I don't think it's yeah, I and I And I also would say, like, like, sometimes thinking globally, about things like that can be very, very difficult. I try to think real locally when I think about how I can help. Um, if I see a community that is not being represented on the stage, for example, at Buddies in Bad Times Theatre, um, like if I'm working on a play perhaps that is written by a cisgendered playwright, then I will make sure that trans artists are involved in some way. Are they the designers? I don't know. Are they like doing sound design? Are they consulting? Like. I make sure that if they are not the driver of the project, then that team is stacked. This is the way that dramaturges can be like agents of change. If I'm not working with a trans artist of color, like I am thinking real locally, real micro, about what power do I have to hire within any room that I run, and how can I make that room um, the most useful room, both to the work, to the communities, um, because it's actually one and the same. Um, so, it, so thinking micro, um, because, yeah, like, when you start thinking macro, it gets really overwhelming very quickly. Any other um, questions? Yes. Um, I've been noticing more and more that um, playwrights have been able to be agents for change in terms of just how they lay out their character descriptions and preferences for casting. I'm wondering if you have thoughts about other ways that playwrights can advocate for certain identities or representation beyond just casting. Because I feel like we've seen, I've, yeah, I've seen more of that in terms of just character descriptions, but it does seem like if we're also talking about audience, we're also talking about all these other things, like, is there? Well, I, I, I personally think, and then I'm going to speak, sorry, just, I'm going to speak, but I think it's about, uh, for me, it's about form. It's always been about form. So I, I would start challenging immersive theater, for instance. I hate that term. Um, I, I did not like throw donuts. I did not like sleep no more. Right? I thought it was a fine date play for people to come and get drunk with their dates, and then have sex afterwards and socialize. And they got to run around a dark warehouse, which was really sexy. So, um, and I felt that it was so anyway immersive. Wow, that it was immersive. So radical, right? Form can sometimes make us uh, anything that that begins to play with narrative, uh, but but in ways that are not trendy. Like, in other words, immersive becomes trendy, and they're all the immersive plays are the same. So I, I, don't know, I think form is important. I think it's possible to pull people into situations they haven't been in, um, and, and, and to make plays work in ways that, one of the things I do, it's a time-worn technique, though, I think we really need it now, is make the unsympathetic, make the evil characters sympathetic, and the good characters evil. Because right now, everything we see is, it's about the poor, people who are good, who we, from the moment the play starts, we know they're good and we feel sorry for them and we hope they win. That's not life. We don't know who's good or bad. People are mixed up. The great writers wrote about people where you went, do I like that person or are they really evil? That to me is really radical and really real. 
I was having something to say about how we can radicalize our playwriting. Yeah, it's I mean, I think like beyond beyond casting of your play, like in your contract, do you have um, like how many tickets need to be given away? Um, how many community events need to happen around this play? Um, uh, are all of these relaxed performances? How many relaxed performances do you want? Like, how many times will you let audiences, I don't know, use phones? Like, what are things that can make people who don't usually go to the theater more comfortable within a theater space? Because actually, depending on what theater you're walking into, if you've never been there before, it can be an incredibly alienating experience. And I think playwrights have a lot of power, or can have a lot of power. Like, if you're coming up on a, a production, there's, like when I was working with Saga Collective um, on Black Boys, um, their contract had a ton of community outreach that we needed to hire a second black producer specifically to work with the community to bring them to the show. And it was a tremendous amount of work, but it brought the community to the play in a way that Buddies itself could not have been able to do. And if it wasn't for Saga Collective itself, we wouldn't have done that. Yes? So, uh, Peter Scott, she her hers. Um, I read a lot for a lot of new play development workshops. Um, and recently, I've been getting by primarily white playwrights of like the whole this person can be played by any race or this person can be played by any gender. Right. And I've just started saying, nope, we're not. I'm not doing this. I'm not even entertaining this for a second round. Um, mainly because I, I just cannot, in 2018, in the world that we live in today, think that some person can be like, you know what? It's fine as long as this person is the other. Like, well, I'll just like, I'll be able to get a production. Um, and because like, that's honestly what it boils down to in a lot of ways. And so I'm wondering, is that the right course of action? Uh, like, is, like, what happens when I do say no to all those people? Uh, but also what happens by, you know, opening up that space to people who are from those communities being able to like talk, to them, talk about themselves. Um, so it's just a big wider industry question, but also what I've been doing. <laughs> I'm talking too much. Anybody here? Uh, yes, you absolutely, I think it is a good idea to say no to those, but I think you need to explain why. Like, you need to hold some sessions to talk about, like, non-traditional casting and, like, because I think people are doing that because they think of it as, um, uh, like, a, a, I don't know, experimental or, like, form-moving decision, and I think, you know, without opening, like, a discussion so people know that why that might be, a weird thing to do, then you're just going to keep getting them and people are going to be like, oh, well, they'd only want writing from people of color, so they're not like, it's actually that specific thing, <laughs> like saying that, that race, like, like exactly what you're saying. So you've got to open the space, I think, for learning within that, within that trope. Yes? Um, I just wanted to say, off the page question, I just wanted to say thank you for the phrase, boy isn't neutral. Um, because I was thinking of the same thing being played and talking to clerics. And I work with clerics who are adult and just like casually in recreational writing plays, which is like, a lovely departure from the professional pressures that I'm used to working with her. Um, but I feel like that's a phrase that is a useful tool to give to writers it's, um, that is, you know, shockingly not as obvious as it should be. Well, I know I didn't make that up. Well, <laughs> I, I am definitely <laughs> quoting something. I did not make that up. You heard it here first. <laughs> I, 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 know, I am absolutely <laughs> quoting someone. I think I heard Cole Alvis saying first, who heard it from someone. Yeah. Mel Hague famously said it. <laughs> Anyone else? Just, yes? Just on the subject of identity, um, and on the subject of playwrights who are not necessarily white, but who are controlling um, the hiring power and community building power that dramaturgs have, um, oh gosh, I lost it. I'm gonna get it back. We can. No, get it um, I, I just wanted to uh, sort of plug the phrase nothing about us without us. Um, I think, especially because I'm, you know, I'm a white lady and I'm queer, but that's basically the only special thing about me. Um, it's very special. Oh, thanks. Um, but, but I think that um, sort of, as Major was saying, there can be sort of this desire to, you know, include everybody without actually talking to any of the people you want to include. And so I think then the impetus of action or the, um, the call to action is um, also partially on us as dramaturgs, working with playwrights, working with directors, to be like, as you said, getting those people in the room, making sure that that conversation does happen. Um, yes? 
<laughs> okay, that was a comment more than a question. Right? It was a comment, yes. Okay, that's great. It's a very Sorry. good comment. <laughs> it's a good comment. Yes. Um, so I wanted to go back a little bit to the audience idea and the play about pausing and how you were kind of talking about a white playwright talking to a white audience, but that wasn't necessarily the story that was being portrayed on stage. Was that the, did I just, I don't know the play and I don't. Oh, that's, uh, those were two separate thoughts. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, so what I'm interested in with this topic and audiences is how um, we take plays like this and how we keep the ideas that we've talked about here in terms of responsibility and accountability when we think about the plays that we're producing and casting and how we look at identity on stage and um, how do we reflect that in the audiences that we have. Like you were talking about community building and how the Song Collective specifically was able to bring audiences that whose, whose identity was reflected on stage. Um, and I'm wondering where the mix is in terms of like having a play that can still educate people who aren't reflected on stage and have them learn from that experience without it being like like touchy feely. You're you're learning, so we're going to treat you really carefully. Um, and also uh, doing plays where people who are often not portrayed on stage see themselves and see their stories and and, and get to enjoy completely that theater and be like, I was seen, I was heard. Um, it's specifically related to this topic of identity and, 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 and fictional constructions of those ideas. Like, right now I don't see a lot of play about, plays about envies, but I want envies on stage. And what, are, so, what, are, what are they? Um, Non-binary folks. Okay. And so, uh, do we put those people in gendered binary roles so that they're on stage, that you see actors performing those roles? And I know it's the responsibility also of us, us as artists, I know this is long, and playwrights to like, write plays that have those characters. But I don't know if you have any any thoughts on audience and how we integrate audience with this idea of, of identity and mm -hmm. reciprocity in terms of that. So just going back to uh, sort of what this example you were setting before, because yeah. I think what I was talking about is um, representing a community um, in a theater that doesn't have much of that community in the audience. Yeah. And my statement was just sort of, well, what's the point? Which right. is different than don't do it. Right? To me, it's do it, but be purposeful in why here, why this stage. Yeah. So, um, for instance, I think that non-binary characters should be on any stage anywhere, no matter the audience. But um, as a matter of a, a purposeful attempt that's also done in conjunction with some sort of community engagement to integrate that type of work into the canon of theater that's being presented there, rather than being this shocking one-off that presents a certain perspective that people who don't know a lot about that community are then going to leave with as truth. Mm -hmm. So if it's, if it's a play about, if it's a radical play about gender and being non-binary, and it's being presented in a house where for the most part, people aren't going to have a rudimentary knowledge of that, uh, that statement or that community. That's going to have an effect, right? And so it's not don't do it. It's just have a purpose in doing it and doing it in an intentional way. Right. And know what is going to become material at the end of that in terms of people's understanding of that identity. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I disagree. You disagree. <laughs> Finally, some disagreement. Head. You're like, uh -huh. <laughs> I think, like, I'm not actually interested in plays that are educating in any sort of way. I'm only interested in plays right now that are written specifically for the audience because I think that other audience actually comes. Okay. And I think we'll actually move the conversation forward if we're not imagining our audience as at that entry level place. Uh, yeah. Because that involves a lot of explanation of things that are actually maybe not important. Okay. But I think we naturally imagine when we're working on plays that are outside of a dominant narrative that we have to explain everything. Right. So what if we imagine that everyone actually already knows a lot of these things? Right. And what, what is that kind of theater? Because I think for the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years, we've been doing that other, the other kind, where we're explaining a lot yeah. about different communities. And so people think they're going to the theater to get an education on a particular, <laughs> and I'm like, that's actually not what this is. Theater is rubbish at communicating information, but it is great at communicating emotion. Now, 
to, I don't think we disagree that much. I don't, I don't actually think we really disagree. My point wasn't about educating, because I hate that. Yes, yes. <laughs> My point is about understanding the impact of your play in that theater. Yes, no, we don't so actually disagree. So if I, not at all, no, if you're doing a play of mine where I'm being hypercritical of effeminate gay men, which I have a tendency to be sometimes, um, I have to understand that if that is being presented to an audience that isn't familiar with the politics of gender expression as it intersects with um, sexual orientation, I run the risk of audiences leaving saying, wow, effeminate gay men are awful. You know, they're bad and now everyone thinks they're bad. I just have to be conscious of that. But that doesn't mean I'm going to put in a monologue that explains my thesis. I'll write that in the playwright notes. Um, I don't know. I think if in 2018 they're walking away and that's the first effeminate gay man they've seen on stage or ever and the first time that they've ever seen one portrayed negatively, like, I don't know. I, I want to give them more the benefit of the doubt. Mm. Like, that they're not going to walk away with this being the only, like, this is one of the powers of me being in 2018 and of, like, inheriting what Sky does, you know? Like, that... We're actually on the back of a but lot of expressions. It's just responsibility again, is all is what I'm saying. But it's if interesting you put it out there, you yeah. have to be aware of what people are gonna be taking away as your message. I just saw this play that was, I think, in my personal view, a very bad play. But at any rate, uh, so this might have been part of its badness or maybe it's part of its wonderfulness. Anyway, but there was a character that was female and not white, who was constantly referred to as our son, whose name, which gives you an idea of the play, was Pee Pee. So that was one of the problems, was every time the son's name was mentioned, Pee Pee, we were all just distracted by the fact that the son was called Pee Pee, which may have been relevant, I don't know, but the son was played by a woman, a young woman, who was also seen to be an adult. Um, so anyway, but, but for me, as a viewer, I was just asking about, and all we could talk about was, and maybe this is our lack of education, was, why? Why was that a girl? Mm. You know, I'm, I'm yes, brought up very binary. So why was that a girl? Like that's I'm just telling you the way an educated un, I'm somewhat uneducated because I'm not gender non-binary, but I'm also queer. So you know what I mean? I, I know we're done. So I came out of it going just I, all I could think about you know was we kept going why 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 was that girl <coughs> called a boy all the time? Why do you think it was? Well, I think the playwright's a bad playwright, but I, because the, the playwright also put in some really offensive racist stuff in the play because it was like, woo, we're going to put a lot of crazy, so I didn't even want to go there. They're going to put a lot of crazy stuff because there was no context for it in this play. But I'm, I'm just saying that that one thing that was there, but I'm just, uh, I'm just doing, being a man in the street. So we have to end, apparently. Thank you.